So, Ruin is finally out, and today we will be taking a look at the Ruined animatronics themselves and going through their whole deal. Not every animatronic from Security Breach returns in Ruin, but many do, and we will be covering them and the new faces alike. We'll start with Glamrock Chica, now ruined and decayed, covered in what looks to be thick cobwebbing or sludge, and filled with trash. Ruined Chica is a rancid mess shuffling through the Pizzaplex. She is the first animatronic technically encountered, but she doesn't become an enemy until later in the DLC. Chica is in a massive state of disrepair. A big chunk of her head is missing, and her right eye is barely staying in its socket. Her left arm is gone while the right's casing is falling away. Casing is missing off of her right thigh and lower left leg. But the limbs are mostly intact. As I said before, she is covered in some kind of sticky webbing. And when jump scared by her, a nasty trash bag will fall out of the gaping hole in her belly. Cassie runs into her in the kitchen, where Chica makes a move at her before powering down. She then disappears for a while and reappears in the plot later when Cassie is making her way into Chica's bakery. When she's turning the equipment on, ruined Chica is on a conveyor belt and rides in assumedly from the kitchen. She then takes a tumble into a recharge station, where she is then electrocuted before climbing out and stalking around, still somehow standing up. At this point, ruined Chica is aggressive, and you must sneak and then run past. Shortly on, she collapses outside the Glamrock Beauty Salon before you run into Roxy. Now there is a slightly hidden route on the back of the bakery that reveals Chica's feeding frenzy, her designated minigame that was cut from Security Breach, which has now been finished and you can play it. Win and you'll get a spare voice box. You can then have Cassie replace the voice box while Chica is sitting down. If you do, she'll give a delighted I smell pizza and drop like a rock. Doing this doesn't affect anything else, as far as I'm aware. It's more just a sort of a nice gesture if you feel particularly bad for Chica, which you might. Though, in the grand scheme of things, Ruin doesn't do much for Glamrock Chica's lukewarm character. The most personality she gets is in the beginning of Security Breach when she runs for Freddy after he collapses, and when she looks generally annoyed after Gregory pushes her into the trash compactor. Ruin doesn't add any additional depth. But at least it doesn't make her seem worse, uh, such as in the case of Ruined Monty, who has devolved from angry gator into vicious ankle biter, snarling and nearly foaming at the mouth. Monty is the actual first threat that is encountered in Ruin, dogging Cassie through Monty Golf and through Monty Golf again, and through a flooded hallway, and just really being a pain in the cabs. Matching his animalistic behavior, Monty is little more than a skeleton with a mouth of teeth. Little of the cool design of the gator remains, and now he just exists to stalk and hunt. And he doesn't look as chill doing it. He also gets in the water now, which somehow doesn't immediately short-circuit him. Well, not until you send a bunch of volts through him. I might be getting ahead of myself, but yes, Monty is technically the only animatronic that is assumedly destroyed in Ruin. There's another character who is almost shut down, but that turns out to be a fake-out. It's just Monty. In fact, Monty kind of gets the short end of the stick. The first and most frequent enemy, no redeeming qualities, his design is rather basic in comparison to the others, just being a skinned metal shell, Ruin didn't really do Monty any favors. It did give Monty a backstory, well, the character, not the animatronic, but that alone doesn't reflect much on the disassembled robo-reptile. There is, in fact, and I'm not going to address it in this video because I want to do this in its own special video, but there is something that comes up in Ruin that makes Monty look really, really bad. But let's move on to someone who does get a little more to work with. The daycare attendant. Trapped in a perpetual nighttime and falling apart at the seams, Sun and Moon are fighting against each other for control, but neither can grasp it. And both are in turmoil because of it, malfunctioning. I've gone over their design before, with a partially busted faceplate and a missing foot, and I find myself constantly sorta of mixed on them. Unlike the other characters who are ruined in gruesome ways that match their injuries and security breach, the daycare attendant just kind of looks a little beat up. It should be noted that the Eclipse design, with the shared glow and the half and half features advertised in the trailer, other than the pants, the pants stay the same, but the glow and the, the half and half in the face only appears for about... 20 seconds. It's kind of like a Vanny situation, but at least the cutscene made it into the game, even if it was reversed to make the scene look completely different. Though I do wonder how and why Eclipse has movable teeth under his faceplate. 
Anyway, on to the encounter. Cassie is trying to get from Monty Golf to a different section of Monty Golf, so she heads through the daycare. Moon grabs her, but she deflects him with a flashlight, which he is sensitive to. Sun appears briefly and begs her to turn the generators on. Then she just casually walks around and turns them on. The daycare attendant just kind of stands on top of a play structure. He doesn't chase you. There is a jump scare, but it's only accessible if you approach them while the generators are still off. And even then, you get plenty of verbal warnings before it happens. The whole stun with the flashlight thing isn't a mechanic, and even though Gregory says later, Now you've got him stuck! You can reboot him! The daycare attendant just kind of stands in place. One of the most interesting things about the Sun and Moon's appearance is that this sort of establishes that it's not just Sun who hurts when they're forcibly switched. At one point during the encounter, Moon shrieks about how the gears in his head turn and hurt when they're switching back and forth. So this is something shared between them both. Before it was believed that, you know, the Sun hurts when he turns into Moon, but Moon's fine. This is a confirmation that is not entirely the case. Stuck in nap time mode, when light is shined on Moon, he doesn't quite turn back to Sun. He just stands there and writhes. Both of them seem totally out of whack, likely because the lighting system is totally shot. Cassie sticks her wrench in a port that didn't exist before and reboots him into Eclipse, a friendly face who sort of acts like a calm sun. So the Eclipse is, in fact, not a mix of sun and moon, but seemingly a third personality produced by both. Balancing out the two, he is friendly and calm, greeting Cassie but insisting that it's not safe and that she needs to get moving while he cleans up for the children coming in the next day. So he's also delusional. Oh man, people are going to love this guy. Be prepared for an influx of fans. Definitely a smoochable animatronic for sure. Even though he unhelpfully tosses Cassie out of the daycare. Total I can fix them energy, and they're not dead. That's a win-win when it comes to fandom. Though death never really stopped fandom in the past, I digress. And that's pretty much the whole deal on the daycare attendant. They don't show up again in the entire game, unlike Monty and Chica. This is their one and done go with a full semi-character arc. Okay, something about the daycare section feels like an afterthought. Sun and Moon don't attack even though they have dialogue from them and Gregory that seems to imply at some point they were supposed to chase you. They toss Cassie out under friendly terms even though they seemed concerned about her, and do so very quickly. And Cassie leaves Monty Golf to come to the daycare to go back to Monty Golf. Yeah, this whole thing feels a little odd, like it was a more shoehorned in section. That would explain why instead of riding on a cable, they just straight up fly now. I mean, it's appreciated to get more sun and moon time, but it does feel a little less like, uh, we need a daycare section, and more like, well, the daycare attendant is popular, we should probably throw something in. Eclipse's design and behavior, too, definitely resembles something more to appease the community, but I'm not saying that's a bad thing. Obviously, they've been paying attention, and we're looking for something to make fans happy. And I know plenty of Sun and Moon fans who are going to probably be all over this. Because even if Eclipse isn't like their headcanons, he's not worse. They're not dead. I'm just saying that, you know, compared to the original daycare section, it kind of falls a little flat. Till we yeet again, I suppose. Now, before I move on to some of the real big deals, let's cover some of the less important fixtures of the Pizzaplex. There are still some functional staff bots, but they are mostly in a state of falling apart. Save for the map bot, who has become the mask bot and has been programmed to hand out security clearance masks to presumably anyone who walks in. There are also some Glamrock endoskeletons, but they virtually look and act the same way as they do in Security Breach, so no real importance here. Towards the end of the game, you can spot the blob for a hot second, but then it disappears and we still don't know what it is. There is an important plot point involving the wet floor sign bots, and an easter egg deactivating them, but this, this is one of those things I'm gonna have to hold over. I shouldn't hold stuff over for another video, but in this case, I really need to tackle this dead on because this is a big revelation. So just know that the wet floor bots are still watching, and there is a disturbing revelation about them that doesn't affect the ending or involve the final boss at all. Candy Cadet has a reappearance in the basement in a broken state. If you find enough tokens, he basically tells you in no uncertain terms the story of a mother and son, and a monster who learned how to mimic, to lure, and prey. Now, this is by the end of the game, so you already know exactly what this is implying, but it's nice to have another Candy Cadet appearance. 
The Lil Music Men both appear in Bonnie Bowl and an event. No longer just one hunting alone, there's nearly a dozen hunting in a pack. Most of them are identical, with broken open mouths, shattered eyes, and torn off top hats. One has a nasty peeled back face, while one who seems to be the leader, who I think only spawns during the jump scares, has rabbit ears and whiskers. They're significantly more threatening than they were in Security Breach, so kudos to that. Now then, are you ready for Freddy? So, Cassie has to swing by Fazer Blast for a second to shut down the security while she's passing through. And while she does, she finds the buried form of Freddy Fazbear himself, or Glamrock Freddy. Now the design is inspired by a major section cut from Security Breach where Freddy was going to be shattered by his bandmates and then chase Gregory. We have the voice lines to back this up. Alas, this was cut from the final game, but we are quite familiar with what Shattered Freddy was supposed to look like by now, featured on a banner advertising the game, which is sort of misleading, and a couple of cameos in the endings. Cassie tries to wake Freddy up. He pushes himself up and turns around and- Oh my god! So when I was going over the Ruin trailer, I mentioned how scary it would be if Freddy got up and didn't have a head. And you know what? It's way creepier in person. This is not a recreation of a cut Shattered Freddy. This is not Freddy. This is Freddy's body, puppeteered by something else's command, casing torn and broken, belly gutted, headless, now using its jagged stomach hatch as a makeshift mouth to crunch Cassie inside, fit with a gift box included. Small note here, but someone in the comments section whose name I missed mentioned that Ruin Freddy might not actually be aggressive or possessed. That what he is doing is not trying to attack Cassie, but protect her by grabbing her and putting her in his stomach hatch. Freddy doesn't have a head, so he might not have any higher thinking. The body might be fully running on muscle memory. In which case, it is performing the last orders or actions it received before it lost contact with its brain. That does make this a little sadder, but it's still a mindless body running around feral. Freddy's ruined body is quite horrifying. This also confirms that the Vanessa saved ending is canon. This is reinforced later and suggested earlier with the sword lodged in the Princess Quest 3 arcade machine, but this brings it full circle. So don't feel bad for this thing. This isn't Freddy. Freddy's off living as a head, or perhaps as something else. One peculiar thing of note is that Freddy has a word prototype written on the bottom of his foot, but as we know from Security Breach, he didn't used to have this. Either this is, I don't know, a new foot, or a new detail added in now that was always supposed to be there, like the multitude of ports that weren't there before. I would guess that that would be it. I don't think this is like a suggestion that this is a completely different Freddy. I think what this is, is just adding future context to something that wasn't there before. Okay, since some sort of crazy Freddy prototype theory was recently spawned, I want to go out of my way and list some other details that weren't in Security Breach and are now in Ruin to show how this inconsistency isn't as mind-breaking as you think. First of all, Sun and Moon's changed port. Their eyes are also different than they used to be, though that could be from their broken state. Not only is Roxy's facial endo different, you might believe that's a mask, but her entire endo is different. The common belief is that this character we'll talk about later is Burn Trap, but his endo does not match Burn Traps either. There's stuff for Faz wrenches all over, and though you can maybe say Vanessa installed all of these systems, Cassie is familiar with the Faz wrench, so they existed before, ergo why Sun's sudden port is so noticeable. Cassie herself changed design before the first trailer and the game, or the first teaser in the game, and this red-eyed creature assumedly never appeared in-game how this is set up, that would mean that Vanessa and Gregory left, and nobody repaired the animatronics from their decommissioning and made only meager efforts to repair before it was completely abandoned. But this was so recently that Gregory and Cassie are still kids. And yet somehow, this meager detail upon all of the other changed details is supposedly telling us that this is a completely different Freddy who was damaged in the same exact way when the same ending is considered canon instead of Oh, I don't know, adding this little detail on to explain why Freddy is so advanced. Let that soak for a second. And to add a little more salt to the wound, to have this Freddy be a different Freddy, Freddy would have had to lose his head, had his body removed, 
Fazbear Entertainment would have to bring in a new Freddy, even though they didn't repair any of the other animatronics, abandon him, then he would have had to have lost his head in the same exact way and got the exact same damage as Freddy in the ending. That doesn't compute. And to add on top of that, because I've heard people say, oh, this is just another Freddy from the Pizzaplex, remember that in Security Breach, Vanessa said that they would replace Freddy with Monty until they could put his casing on another endo. So no, there aren't more than one Freddy walking around, likely why Bonnie was so quickly shafted instead of just getting a new one out there. I just needed to put this up because of all the things you can make a convoluted theory on, this is not one of them. And the problem with this is this is just a result of people wanting to... People not being content with how Security Breach ended, Bruin finally went out on a limb and said what ending was canon. It actually said something in concrete for once. And the way that theorizing works with FNAF, well, nothing can be concrete. If I don't like this one twist, I'll just say it never happened. Because Fazbear Entertainment made up all the old games, so I can just say anything was a hallucination, anything was fake, anything wasn't real. But in this context, having to go out of your way to believe something completely different from what we actually know doesn't make sense. The body chases Cassie around Phaser Blast before she turns off the inhibitor that allows her to put on the Vanny mask. Upon doing so, the body pretty much disappears and doesn't come back. Though even if it doesn't, this alone foretells us Freddy's fate post-security breach, and it's not too bad of one considering the alternatives. I think that's what makes this so creepy, just the fact that this isn't Freddy. This isn't just a shattered animatronic. This is just his remains. This is a zombie. This is a piece of what he left behind. It doesn't even have a brain. Papa Bear's out living his best life while his shambering lower half figures out a makeshift mouth all the better to eat you with. And while I'm somewhat sad that Shattered Freddy proper is gone forever, and the story surrounding it, and his killer voice lines, I do stand by what I said before and that there's... No way they could have gotten that exact moment back into the game. Doing something new is better than a lesser version of what they almost had. Case in point, they actually gave the shattered and child cry scene to another animatronic entirely. Let's talk about Roxy. So, Roxy is an extremely weird case. A broken mess, faceless, with an endo that doesn't match her original one. It is believed that she might have been trying to rebuild or mask her face, but this isn't confirmed. There's a line that might imply this, but it's kind of kept a little vague. Her hair and tail have been burned off, her casing wasted away, but unlike Chica and Monty, she's still capable of speech and somewhat still aware of her surroundings. There were also people who believed that Roxy was going to be a friendly ally to Cassie, and they were technically right. Let me explain. So, Cassie first encounters Roxy in the Glamrock Beauty Salon, where it is hinted that the two had a history. I'll get back to that later. Roxy hears her and starts to pursue, but then hears Gregory and dashes off to find him. Cassie then has to avoid Roxy, who will attack and kill her if she catches her. I had a big oopsie here and forgot to mention an important moment here when Roxy actually grabs Cassie, Cassie yells, and Roxy, realizing her mistake, lets her go. Later on, Gregory reveals that Roxy is part of the security system and must be shut down. Thankfully, Roxy has gotten herself pinned under some heavy equipment. Unfortunately, Roxy has recognized Cassie and is nice to her. The worst thing in the world before you're about to off someone. She remembers her having her birthday party at the Pizzaplex. Apparently, Cassie's friends didn't show up and likely Roxy remembers her so well because she was the one who stayed with and comforted her. There's also a cutout of Gregory comforting a crying Cassie who's dolled up elsewhere. It is possible this is also a reflection of the same memory of a birthday party where nobody showed up. Perhaps that's how they met, though that's just speculation. What is clear is that this event left an impact on Roxy, who is almost, almost uncharacteristically soft with Cassie. In fact, Due to the rushed nature of this bonding being introduced in this conversation, despite the clues that Cassie likes Roxy, such as her walkie-talkie description saying that she's her favorite, and the clothing taking inspiration by her, including the cutout where it shows that she was wearing her makeup, it does feel a little out of the blue, admittedly, but it is still sweet, and it's sad to have to sacrifice her. Though, if I may, the whole Roxy being a security node thing is sort of ham-fisted. None of the other animatronics had that. What makes Roxy special? 
well, that's because she's the one people like, and so she's the one that gets the focus. So, her suddenly showing a very caring side and having a sad death scene, it's very deliberate. That's not necessarily a bad thing, like I said with the sun and the moon, but it is a little noticeable. Though, spoiler alert, Roxy doesn't stay down. She swoops in at the last moment to defend Cassie from the final threat hiding in the depths of the Pizzaplex, becoming the heroine of the story. That's a bit deliberate too, but admittedly, Roxy's cool enough that I'm glad they did this. But they gave her more of a focus. Sure, some of the other characters could have used more of that, like Chica and Monty, but Roxy's a fan favorite and that's worth quite a bit. I feel like I actually like her quite a bit more now. I never disliked her, but this definitely makes her more likable. It gives her a soft, warm, and approachable side. Moving on, I don't want to address it here, but we actually do see what happened to Glamrock Bonnie, and we know what happened to him now. But the reason I don't want to go into it is because there's some things I have to tackle alongside it, and I think it would become... It needs to be its own video. I need to tackle it all at once. It would take way too much time. It would totally overtake this video because it's a really big deal. So let's move on to the other rabbit at the Pizzaplex. No, not Vanny. She's not a thing anymore. But the Entity, a rabbit resembling virtual creature with a dark purplish body broken with white cracks. A structure of wire supports its middle while its hands are free floating and its body ends in a tail. The mix of tail and tubish body structure kind of reminds me of the keepers from Bindi and the Dark Revival. Funny enough, it functions very similarly as well. While the keepers are the enforcers and caretakers of Wilson's vision of the Ink Demon's realm, the entity is part of a security system built by Vanessa to watch over the Pizzaplex and keep something awful trapped in the basement. Though it does a rather lousy job. Like, first off, it controls the animatronics and security systems, so likely it controls the rabbit-eared mask bot that has the specially made controller mask that Vanessa made. It then just hands it out to the first kid who walks in. Absolutely bang up job, buddy. Indeed, while Cassie is slowly getting deeper and deeper, the entity can't do anything except hang out in the general vicinity and send down broken bots after her. I don't know if it's him or Vanessa, but someone really dropped the ball here. Okay, but what is the entity? Believed to be some variation of Glitchtrap, possibly, which would explain its aggressive behavior, the entity is part of the security network created by Vanessa to contain the Big Bad of Ruin. This network is called Mexis, M-X-E-S, which stands for Mimic Exenophobic Eternal Security Wear? They never say. Or Mexis. I'm at the crossing between the Twisted Ones and Security Breach. I must be at the Mexis of the Universe. But as you can probably tell, the entity doesn't have that much of an impact. It's unable to jump scare Cassie. It can, well, it can jump scare her, but it cannot kill her. It can send the animatronics after her, and they can kill her, but it itself cannot. It is also kept a little vague to which animatronics are being controlled by Mexis. It seems from what I'm getting that all of the animatronics that are attacking her are being controlled by the Entity. And why it would seem this way is because the Entity is outright trying to stop her from going down into the basement. The thing in the basement wouldn't be trying to stop her. Speaking of the thing in the basement, it's time to talk about the elephant in the room. Or the elephant hanging up on the shelf. The Mimic. Or assumedly the Mimic, as it's never named in Game or in the Files, this creature is the final boss of Ruin, the big bad that Vanessa and Gregory are trying to seal away, the thing that lured Cassie in somehow. I mean, it's not, it's never made really clear how the Mimic first contacted Cassie before she got to the Pizzaplex. In fact, there's not a lot about the Mimic at all. It pretends to be Gregory, and then when Cassie appears, it chases her, and then it's kind of over. It's kept very, very vague. Indeed, this might not be the Mimic you're expecting if you're keeping up with the recent theories or Red Tiger Rock, the Mimic that is willingly choosing to copy Afton, which is virtually an Afton with another name, but a creature closer to its initial concept, an Indo that consistently mimics, but is otherwise violent by nature. And let's nip this in the bud right away. The game doesn't say that Mimic is Burn Trap. As a matter of fact, not only is Mimic's model vastly different than Burn Trap's, but the way Mimic works and acts simply doesn't align with Burn Trap in the slightest. 
And because I know someone will say it, yes, it is true that Ruin claims the alternate endings were imagined by Gregory. But we know that the blob not only exists, but somehow resembles exactly what Gregory imagined it looking like. So why not Burn Trap? Personally, I think the mimic is exactly what it comes off as, a replacement for Burn Trap. People often didn't go over as well as Steel Wool would have liked, I don't think. They apparently told MatPat directly that they changed plans at the last minute because he guessed something. I'm not sure if that was the inclusion of Burn Trap and that they were initially planning on doing the mimic and then made it into Burn Trap, or if this is another extension of that somehow, because even in some of the earlier trailers, Burn Trap's hand appeared, but it was in a completely different location, and Burn Trap had lines that never made it back in, so the, the yada yada yada. Okay, so what I think they might have done is effectively wrote him out and put this new villain in, explaining why the blob appears and Burn Trap doesn't, explaining why the underground pizzeria has now been changed to fit this new narrative, explaining why the mimic kind of feels just dropped in when it didn't exist in Security Breach, explaining why the supposed canon ending of Security Breach has a cheap comic, while another ending, the lengthiest to get and the one that features Burn Trap, had a fully animated one, which would suggest a higher importance. So in conclusion, the mimic is here to fix the problem with bringing Afton back again. How does it work? so-so. Uh, I mean, the way it functions is distinct from Afton, yes, but it's kinda just... So, I will say the way the Mimic comes off in the games is way better than it's portrayed in the books. It's a lot more threatening, it's a lot less heavy-handed, but... So the Mimic is this flimsy looking but actually strong Indo who is made to fit into suits. He mimics Gregory to lure Cassie down and set him free. How this works changes halfway through the game. See, initially the Mimic is capable of fully replicating Gregory's voice and saying whatever he wants. Though towards the later half of the game, suddenly you can hear how the Mimic is just splicing up things Gregory has said. Why this changes is to, I suppose, tip the audience off that this isn't Gregory. But like, you know from the second you hear Gregory babbling and saying, There's no time! Don't call the police, just get down here! But Gregory, I don't know. Sorry, I can't hear you. That this is a scam. The Mimic has a few cameo mascots in the basement that he can climb into, but it doesn't. It, it just gets in one that's a combo of all three stitched together. It then continues running blindly and gets axed. See, this is the problem with something like the Mimic. The concept is pretty neat if kind of stagnant, but the follow-through pales in comparison. FNAF has done Indos mimicking people before and made something really creepy with Ennard. Mimic is diet Ennard with a weak design and, if the books are to be believed, a backstory virtually identical to Hot Charlie's from The Fourth Closet. Besides, who knows if we'll even keep the Mimic for much longer. Vanny was built up for two games, appeared for five minutes, and has already been replaced in the DLC of the game she was supposed to headline in. Vanessa gets mentioned in Ruin a few times, but she doesn't actually do anything. It's just an attempt to assure Vanessa's good before the movie comes out with her playing the role of questionable cop who knows too much and possible love interest. Though admittedly, the Mimic's existence raises a lot of plot holes that I doubt will ever be truly answered. Like, if Vanessa and Gregory left the Pizzaplex, how did they find the Mimic downstairs? If there's a scooping room literally right there, and Vanessa has maps of the basement so she would know it's there, why didn't they ever try to attack the Endo? In one ending, Cassie kills it in like 20 seconds. We could wait to see if the books explain, but after the sexy anime chicks and super cancer stories, I don't really feel like sorting through a bunch of filler for possibly one answer. And since I'm done talking about this thing, let's talk about the mascot stashed in the basement. These suits look like they belong in a completely different game, looking unsettlingly realistic compared to FNAF's cartoonish art style. They would maybe fit in better in FNAF Plus or JR's, or even Porkchop's Adventure. The characters consist of a lion in a letterman jacket, a bird with librarian glasses and an apron, and an elephant dressed like a clown. Being suits, not animatronics, it's possible they came from a franchise before Freddy's existed, or that they were some of those inappropriate suits that Phone Guy mentioned in FNAF 3. It should be noted that their eyes almost resemble glitch traps, or the suit that Glitch Trap was modeled off of, who was also a wearable mascot, though it's unclear what that might mean. 
It's very possible that these three will be featured in a future FNAF game if it ever jumps back in time. After all, we're so far ahead in the future now with the technology that traditional animatronics and classic FNAF animatronics are largely outdated, so if we want to ever see that again, we'll probably have to go back a few decades. These characters might work for that, but we'll see if there's anything done with them. On the final animatronic, who isn't quite an animatronic, we have Helpy, an AI system meant to help lead Cassie along. At times it is disingenuous, seemingly leading her into the entity's clutches, maybe, and falsely misleading her about the situation, implying she's hallucinating or that she's just not thinking straight. There is a reason for this. Normally when first introduced to Helpy, he has blue eyes and talks in a friendly and to-the-point manner. When Helpy starts getting cryptic and starts to mislead Cassie, his eyes change from blue to yellow, and he has distorted cracks on his face. So, yeah, Helpy too is a mouthpiece like the phony Gregory voice. Likely for the mimic, as it doesn't make sense that the entity would encourage Cassie to continue into the depths. Unless it was really looking for a reason to attack her. This would align with the fact that Cassie hears Gregory's voice in places she's not supposed to, such as in the daycare where Gregory is constantly droning on, not through the radio, but directly into her head. With the yellow eyes, it could mean that the Mimic is possessing the system. Though this doesn't exactly line up with how Mimic is portrayed in Ruin, though I'm not going to go back into the funky plot holes with Mimic right now. The most interesting thing about Helpy comes from the secret ending in Ruin, one where Cassie sees an image of Vanessa and Gregory on the grassy hill, along with a Helpy one that resembles the Helpy mascot who doesn't exist in Security Breach in animatronic form. Now you might notice someone else is missing. Freddy, or his head, is not in this scene. As established in the Saved Vanny ending, which is the ending that's heavily hinted to be the canon one, being the only one that Gregory hasn't drawn comics of, and all the other stuff I mentioned earlier, Gregory is able to revive Freddy using the head repair station. While not canon, the van ending suggests that there's other ways to charge Freddy, Considering that Vanessa is capable of building a whole security system and assumedly knows how to tinker with animatronics, it's not too much of a stretch to think she could come up with a solution to charging Freddy. Yet, Freddy's not here, and suddenly this random Helpy animatronic appears. It is possible that Helpy is actually Freddy, this Helpy, or an extension of him, either built into this new body or uploaded into it. It is quite possible that perhaps the blue-eyed friendly Helpy, the one that doesn't gaslight us, too could be an extension of Freddy. Though, how he would be both hooked onto the system and out with Gregory is a bit unclear. The two Helpies could simply be entirely independent of one another, with the one being part of Freddy and the other being part of the AI in the mainframe. That this ending is to show that not only was Gregory not the real Gregory, but Helpy too was not the real one. Or perhaps I just like to think that Freddy's out there living his best life. Being a papa bear in this small, cute body, where he can both watch over Gregory and easily hide in, oh, I don't know, a duffel bag for easy traveling. I also just realized that Helpy is straight up eating an orange and blue ice cream cone with the lightning bolt patterns on it. Now there's an extremely on-the-nose hint about his connection with Freddy. He's practically eating Freddy. Gregory's just eating standard strawberry, and Vanessa's having some green that's probably the same mint chocolate chip that she had in the original ending. So, those are all of the animatronics introduced or reintroduced in Ruin, not counting that horrifying crawling rabbit skeleton Wendigo that got found in the files, but not in the game. So, I hope this kind of brought you up to speed and gave you sort of a general overview of all of these many different faces that appeared in the game. Thank you for watching.